Okay. Handwriting analysis as an adjunct to persuasion and influence is absolutely vital. In the, in the, in the school of, in, I'm gonna erase this and redo it. It's, I'm actually doing it in my handwriting. I don't want you to see my, inside my psyche. <laughs> it's a scary place for me. But um, in, the in the model of persuasion and influence that I teach, you have what I call the, the three I model. Okay? And that means identity, intelligence, and influence. Most people move through the world focusing on this one. How can I make people do stuff? Well, if you want to be able to get people to do stuff, you have to master these two. Okay? Identity means who are you as a person? What is your identity? What are your core beliefs, your core attributes? What are your uh, skill sets that you bring to bear on a given situation? Okay? The more power, the more powerful an identity you possess, the easier influence becomes globally, as well as one-on-one. -on -one. This goes back to something that I, I first learned from Ken at Cleveland, which was called the be, uh, do, do, and have model. Most people go through life starting from the right and going this way. They think if I have this, I'll be able to do that so I can be this. But if you start from this place, all these others tend to take care of themselves. Make sense? In a pickup and seduction scenario, uh, sports performance, sales, we would call this <coughs> inner game. Okay? Now, the fusion between identity and influence is this area we call intelligence. And when I mean intelligence, I'm not talking about smarts. I'm not talking about uh, your ability to, to score well on a written test or, or whatever. I'm not even talking about IQs or EQs or you know, emotional coaching. What I'm talking about, in essence, is your ability to gather information. Oh my God, they found me. <laughs> information. Now, there's a saying you should write down. It's kind of scary, but it's true. Goes like this. It was given to me by uh, uh, one of my mentors when I was studying kinesic interview and interrogation. If I know you better than you know me, I can influence you. If I know you better than you know yourself, I can control you. People are going through the world blissfully unaware of who and what they really are and what they really believe and are willing to act upon. The other, the corollary of that is they're constantly projecting who they really are and what they really want and believe onto everyone around them. If you have enough sensory acuity, the person you're speaking with will tell you everything you need to know to make them pretty much do whatever you want and have them feel good about it. That's the key to the persuasion model that I teach. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God, you brought cake. So Yay! <laughs> Come on in. I, this shirt's more remarkable, though. <laughs> That's the key. There's a lot of people who, who have an understanding of these skills who are moving through the world just taking things from people and leaving shattered remains and, and abused people and you know, hurt feelings everywhere they go. I'm going to suggest that there's a better way. Go through the world making everybody you interact with feel tremendously good. Showing them how to get exactly what they want and linking it to getting, helping them get, help you get what they want. And you're going to discover very, very quickly that you don't have to use a tremendous amount of influence. In fact, the more information you gather about the people, situations, and environments you're going to be working in, the less influence you have to wield consciously. <coughs> okay. It's the difference between karate and Aikido, or Aikido Jiu-Jitsu. In karate, we're going to sit there, we're going to block, we're going to punch, we're going to knock you down. Tai Chi, Aikido, we're just, the guy's coming at me, we're just going to move a little bit, and then we're going to go, Ping! and he's going, whoa! And he'll put himself where we want him to go. Because that's where we want him to go anyway. Make sense? 
I use a lot of martial metaphors because I'm a martial artist. Deal with it. All right. But information and in, or the intelligence part of the I3 model that I'm talking about is really one of the most powerful segments. You, mean, you, can't, you can do intel influence without it. I mean, you can just throw random techniques out there and you'll get some effect. But if you want the most bang for your buck, if you want the most return on your investment, you have to pay attention to the people you are dealing with. Even more fundamental to that, you have to pay attention to the person you are inside. Take an accurate inventory of your strengths, your weaknesses, your beliefs, the things you're willing to do, the things you're unwilling to do. Your physical appearance versus how you, and, and in terms of physical appearance, and, and what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go globally with this, attractiveness. Attractiveness is extremely subjective, but here's the bottom line on this. It's an ugly truth about attraction and attractiveness. Good looking, or attractive people get more stuff. Period. And test after test, Attractive people, people who are perceived as being attractive, get more stuff. I didn't write the rules, I just made the report. But once you accept that and understand it and act upon it as if it were actually true, then you know where to start in terms of your identity. Start improving your appearance and attractiveness based on, important, the areas and environments in which you are going to be operating. Okay. If the ladies came to tonight's workshop dressed in really short skirts and high heels and halter tops, the guys would have a ball, but it really would be a very different, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be an appropriate outfit for this kind of environment. By the same token, if we go to a nightclub in a, in a tuxedo, we're going to look extremely out of place. No matter how good we look, we don't fit. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to lapse even further with this. Uh, since I do a lot of work in helping guys and gals improve their relationships. And uh, anybody, anybody here ever heard of a book called The Game? Yeah. Okay. The guy from LA. Yeah, the guy from LA. Neil Strauss. Yeah. Who is a master at sucking you into his world, by the way. Uh, <laughs> really is. He's very good. Um, there was this concept that came out called peacocking. Anybody ever heard that term peacocking? Yeah. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Thank you. This means yes. This means no. This means oh shit, he's going to call on me. <laughs> I changed it, see? Um, now the, the concept was actually the whole idea of dressing in such a way that you attract attention to yourself. A guy heard, most of you guys have probably heard of a guy named Mystery. If you ever heard of a show called The Pickup Artist, you know who I'm talking about. If not, you should rent it if you can get a copy of it and watch it because there's a lot of good stuff. If you just par away all the reality TV crap, there's a lot of good principles that he's teaching. Okay? Peacocking is the idea that you want to dress in such a way that you attract attention that you seem somehow, the, uh, you want to be the 800 pound gorilla in the room. The problem with this is a lot of guys understood the outer message but not the inner message. The reason people like Mystery and Style, or Neil Strauss for lack of a better word, can get away with peacocking, which is dressing very outlandishly, very exotically, is because their inner game, their self, their identity, their self image is strong enough to support it and be comfortable. If you do not have a strong enough self-image, the clothes wind up wearing you, mm -hmm. and you wind up looking like a moron, <laughs> to be kind. You look like somebody trying to be somebody. And believe me, that comes across. Okay? So remember when we're talking about influence, and we're going to work on a very small, small segment, but it's, but it's nuclear power, a nuclear-powered small segment tonight, and that's hypnotic language patterns. Okay? Now, Kip, I would like to introduce uh, Kip uh, Rohde. He's been uh, a good friend of mine for many, many years. He was actually my first assistant organizer here with the NLP Power Group. And uh, he has a, a chiropractic office out in Poway, so if you ever need to be fixed and you're out that way, stop in and Kip will take care of you. Uh, Kip has been through this lecture probably more times than he ever wants to admit. Okay? But he's very, very good at what he does. So by all means, if you get a chance to work with him today, please do so. We're going to be talking about seven specific language patterns. Now, this takes into consideration that you know all the other things that I've been talking about. You have an understanding of identity. You have an understanding of the importance of gathering intelligence about the people that you're dealing with. We cover that very in depth in CPI and even more in depth in our killer influence programs. And we will be doing some workshops that serve as an introduction 
to those particular skills, specifically sens uh, sensory acuity and calibration for, uh, in the future. But today is going to focus specifically on the bread and butter language patterns that make everything you say become a compelling hypnotic induction, that makes everything you say enticing to the people listening to you, so that you automatically cause people to go into a light but very malleable trance state where they just hang on every word and people just start to feel really good about you as you continue to talk, kind of like now. Come back to the room. <laughs> All right, so everybody bring paper today? Yep. Good, because you're going to be doing some writing. All right. Today's segment is called Stealth. I think that's just a really cool name, but it does actually stand for something. Strategic suggestion, key here word is strategic and suggestion, it's not random, true, but it just fits, easily applied, and that's the key here, if it's not easy to apply, you won't use it, period, end of story. You'll often discover, as you, especially as you get deeper into things like the martial arts, persuasion and influence, that some of the most powerful principles, the most powerful techniques that you can use are also the simplest. They're the, they're the easiest to apply. There's a reason that basics are basics. Okay? Language. Or actually, it's linguistic. Linguistically triggered, to be specific. In other words, we're going to learn how to put people into trance and into malleable states of compliance through the use of specific language patterns. And, him, and of course, H is hypnosis. Did you say the T? Yeah, linguistically triggered. Well, I, I ran out of room over here. Strategic suggestion through easily applied linguistically triggered hypnosis. Or you could just say stealth, because it just sounds cool. Oh, I want to be here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What was the T again, please? Linguistically, linguistically triggered. No, a T, the first T. Oh, through. Through? Yeah, as in moving through. Oh, I thought it was through. Strategic suggestion to easily apply linguistically triggered hypnosis. Darmesh, come on in. Are we going to need more chairs? Mark. That could be a yes, that could be a no. I don't yes. know. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. I'm, I apologize for the slightly compressed environment today, but since we have new tenants here and their lit hours are much later than when we used to, uh, we used to have these, we had to uh, give them some room to breathe. It's only fair. All right. Now, we're going to take out a piece of paper. How many people would actually like to go into trance today? Raise your hands. Raise your hands, come on. Yes, yes. All right. Don't give me this don't call on me shit, Chris. You know what you do. Your arm is sore. Your arm is sore. What have you been doing? As if I didn't know. Uh, let me see here. This is what I get for trying to use notes. It never works for me. Some people can get away with notes. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Write these down. Adverb, adjective. Awareness. Spatial. And there's a couple of subcategories in there. Um, spatial. I'm forgetting one. Who can spit it out there? What's the one I'm looking for, James? Temporal? temporal? Oh, okay, Caleb. <laughs> You're right, actually, it is temporal. Now, a little line. And below that line, I'm going to write cause and effect. Um, 
complex equivalents. I'll move in a second so you guys back there can see. And direct commands. Taken all together, they comprise what we call in CPI the Magnificent Seven plus or minus two. These are the bread and butter nuts and bolts language patterns that turn everything you say into a compelling hypnotic induction without sounding weird, creepy, vague, or confusing. Important distinction. There are lots of NLP style patterns and Ericksonian language patterns out there that will blow you into trance. They will also confuse the hell out of you and you can't use them in the boardroom or in the nightclubs or in any non-therapeutic, non-seminar based interaction. Therefore, they are not useful. These seven patterns, taken as a whole, are the most cross-contextual, they are the most fundamental, they are the easiest to use. Why? Because they're already occurring in your speech anyway. It just takes a little bit of tweaking for you to create nuclear-powered conversational hypnotic suggestions just by where you place these kind of words in the structure of what you do. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I want you to go, now the reason we talk about seven plus or minus two is because the common belief is that the conscious mind, which we, most, we spend most of our time thinking is in charge of us, can only process seven plus or minus two bits of information every second or whatever length of time. <coughs> now, it goes back to what we call chunk size. Now, you can do all kinds of weird gymnastics and create bigger chunks or smaller chunks, but the bottom line is, I created this stuff so that it was easy for you to remember. How many of you ever gotten out into the real world, thought, man, it'd be cool to use some kind of language pattern and couldn't remember a damn thing? Raise your hand. <laughs> Bingo. <Okay. laughs> all right? The CPI model that we teach is based on what I call the championship model. What is the championship model? It's something once, I, once again pulled from my martial arts and my study and modeling of martial arts champions. <coughs> Most martial arts champions in their given discipline could speak the entire language of their art. They knew all the moves, they knew all the forms, they knew all the jargon. But when it came down to winning in the ring, they relied on five to seven techniques over and over and over again. And when the shit hit the fan, that's what they used. So we apply that same model to persuasion and influence. This is all you need to know as far as language patterns go. That was right, I like that. Okay, Master this, but seven plus or minus two makes it really, really easy. Now, I could ask, now what I'm asking you to do here is still the same as me asking you to memorize this following string of numbers. 858-947-8382. Shut up, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, if I ask you to recall that number verbatim without parsing it into a phone number type syntax, that would be kind of difficult, wouldn't it? But if we divide it up into 858-947-8382, we've now gone from seven discrete chunks to three chunks of three each, or four, two, two at three and one at four. Yes? Quick little pattern is if you put a regular American phone number into like Tijuana's pattern, most people can't remember it. Yeah, it's gone. It's, it's, some, it's a social hypnotic <laughs> operator we can use to act. We actually, uh, Steve Pickett uses it to induce trance in people all the time. He says, give me your phone number backwards. Oh, <laughs> down they go. <laughs> That's a good one. It is a good one. Okay, but here's the point. CPI is designed for use out in the real world. <clears throat> and so we use this. Seven plus or minus two, but now we have to make it even simpler. Take your seven language pattern. Chunk it down into two discrete families. So now we have one group of adverbative awareness and temporal, and one family of cause and effect, complex equivalence, and direct command. Why do we do it this way? Because these are very, very similar in that they are one thing. Well, there are a bunch of things, but primarily they are descriptions. They are descriptions. They are, descri they are descriptors. They describe things. This family is more based, it goes more towards beliefs and perceptions. Okay? And it, so it's, it's more direct. What we want to do ultimately, the strategy that we apply 
where we're going to wield influence, is we're going to wrap these inside of these. Make sense? Okay. I'm glad you said that. <clears throat> Cause and effect, complex equivalence. All beliefs, whether the ones you know about, the ones you don't know about, are stated in cause and effect terms. Okay, I've played this game with some of you before, but if you, want to, if you ever want to unpack that structure, <coughs> all you have to do is ask somebody what they believe, and one of the key words for the cause and effect category is because. So I'm gonna, we'll just do a, a real quick one real quick. Uh, we'll play with uh, Lindy. Tell me something you believe. Make it simple so I don't have to get really bizarre. Um, you don't have any simple beliefs? Um, I guess uh, I believe that there is some higher being. Okay. okay. You believe that there's some higher being. We're getting yeah. into a faith question. <laughs> higher being. Okay. Let me just. Let me. Has everybody got this? So I can erase it. Yeah. Now I know Kip's never seen this exact presentation of this, so this is this is actually a simpler way to do this if you want to think about it. <clears throat> There's a higher power. Now, what we've done is we've only, we've only uncovered one half of that belief. Then you believe in a higher power because Whatever comes to mind is fine. Okay. Um, uh, because if I didn't, then the world would not be as uh, good of a place. Uh, there would be nothing. The world would not be as good of a place. I'm not passing judgment on the belief. No, no, okay. What I did just do was uncover the reason why she believes what she believes. Okay. The because elicits the other half of the belief. When you talk to people in this structure, everything you say comes across as a belief. Because it matches their internal structure, it's accepted as a belief. And I've done some of the most, matter of fact, if you go to the, I think, uh, if you go to the bottom of the NLP Today website, the bottom of the NLP Power website, you'll see this little video clip where I actually push this to the limit. I think, Jamie, you were there when I did yeah. that, right? When I took two completely non-related things and using this pattern made them sound perfectly natural. In spite of the fact that the people in the audience knew they had nothing, it was absolute junko logic. Okay, and that's exactly what we're talking about. We are not logical creatures. <laughs> we are not even rational creatures. If you don't believe me, buy a book called Predictab or Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. It's required reading for my mastermind people. Uh, we might touch a little bit on that uh, today because they're fun things that you can play with. But simply being here allows you to begin to understand that using cause and effect belief system or belief language automatically makes you a more powerful presenter because you can instantly change the way you speak to naturally match someone's internal environment. And that means you're already becoming more powerful because you have that understanding. Doesn't that make sense? Yes? You just no, it doesn't. <laughs> How does you sitting in that chair mean anything? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> See, he came up with his own reason. That's the cool thing about this. When you do this to somebody and they agree with you, even if you point out the weird, rash, weird logic about it, they will come up with their own reason for why it could be true. <laughs> we call that trance logic. You guys from the mastermind last week when we were doing trance phenomena, you guys were deeply, were intimately familiar with not wanting to do you know, the whole deep trance phenomena thing, but here's the bottom line. 
I could just as easily say, because the moon is made of green cheese, means you can learn this material powerfully and use it to make every part of your life exactly what you want it to be. About as likely. Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about programming the subconscious mind directly without question. Hmm? So you're talking about programming the uh, subconscious mind without question. Well, you may question it, but as you're thinking about what I just said, don't you find your mind trying to come up with all the weird mental gymnastics to how that, where I'm coming from and why that could be true? Yeah. Yeah. When you say, well, well, maybe he's talking about it like this. You start coming through all these little, don't, most of you will probably realize you're coming through these little internal gymnastics to figure out, well, where is he really coming from? That's a trance. And that's one language pattern. Yes? Isn't it just like you say so many things and the mind finally just surrenders? Isn't well, that's overwhelm. Okay, and when I'm gonna when I'm when I do these really outlandish language patterns, it's because I want to show you how far you can push and still sound conversational and natural. If you do this with things that are plausible, logical, and verifiable, they have no chance. I don't care how logical and rational you think you are, you can't defeat these language patterns. I've tried. Okay, it doesn't work. You can't parse it. Once you start doing this model, you can't parse the language fast enough to stop yourself from getting the suggestions. In fact, the act of trying to parse it down forces you to miss all the stuff that went on after it. <laughs> so these are hardwiring to the brain. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's, this, is, this goes right to the hardwiring if you want to be you know, technical about it. All right? And for women, it's, it's even more powerful because their brain is hardwired for language differently than men's. Okay? They have a richer experience of language than men do. Okay. I often joke that men and women are different, but not that much, but it's the differences that are important. The similarities are, the same, are important too, but it's, it's, it's also important to understand what to do, when, and which to focus on. Does that make sense? This means yes, this means no. <laughs> okay. By the way, that's important. This always means yes, this always means no, regardless of what the mouth is saying. Okay? <clears throat> so... Any questions on that? Yes. The name of that book again, please. Predictably Irrational. So is there power in, do you, just the single association, a cause and effect, or do you string them together? Oh yeah, you always or string them together. So you have to make a sequence. And well, you can, you could just literally say, sitting in that chair causes you to absorb this information powerfully. And that would make perfect sense, mm -hmm. until you really think about it. Mm -hmm. How does sitting in that chair cause you to do anything? If you have the opportunity, well, yeah, maybe that makes sense. Yeah. And if it makes sense, it's accepted. Yeah. Doesn't that make sense? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> he likes to fight me. He, when he comes to martial arts class, I go to demonstrate a technique, he goes... <laughs> <laughs> I think he's trying to go to the bathroom or something. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Try not to go to the bathroom. <laughs> try, not to, try, not, try in vain not to go to the bathroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to die. All right. <laughs> So, uh, usually I start off with adverb adjective presuppositions, but since, as this thing becomes more organic. By the way, um, just, uh, I'm going to put a little pause here. I'm going to kind of open, leave this loop open for a little bit. What I'd like to do, my goal here when I do these, these little workshops, is to give each of you something that you can go out tomorrow or tonight and use. So it's important for me to know, kind of take a little x-ray, find out what it is you want to get out of tonight, so I can make sure that you get it. Would that be okay if I just went around real quick and got a little bit of information from everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Let's start with you. Yes, sir. Charlie, um, I'm so new. I just like to identify my identity. Identify Actually, your identity? Okay. Yeah, how do I discover what that is? Okay, well, I don't know if that falls within the realm of hypnotic language, but we'll see what we can do but with no, that. You just mentioned it at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Well, it's important, first of all, to make it explicit. See, most people just, they just think influence, influence, influence. But to use a military metaphor, how do you know where the bad guys are if you don't have radar or somebody looking out and, and seeing what the land looks like, where they could be hiding, where are the possibilities? You don't know. You have to understand how to operate within the environments and the cultures. And when I say culture, I'm not just talking about what country you're from. I'm talking about corporate culture. I'm talking about social culture. I'm talking about various ethnic communities. You know, the whole 
Anything that can be implied as a culture, you have to understand those norms and be able to operate within that frame at least well enough to lead people into your frame. And when I talk about frames, I'm talking about, and when we talk about frames, we're talking about going meta frames, which makes people really trance out really, really fast. But here's the fastest and easiest way to understand frame. Imagine that there's a part of you that is a movie director slash producer. There's another part of you that is the protagonist in a movie scene, and another part of you that is, well, maybe another person is another actor in that movie scene. Now, the director says, okay, let's say James is, is me. James, in this scene, you are the prize that every woman wants. Okay? You're constantly being approached by, by women who just want you and blah, blah, blah. And over here, it's Karen, maybe she's the other actor. And I'm just using these as an example. Karen, you see this guy, and he's one of the hottest, most sexiest, most attractive guys you're in, and you just want him to notice you. And you just would get such a rush if he would just notice you and pay attention to you and, and ask you out. Action. All of a sudden, a program is initiated. Okay? Now, the program, both the ends of the program are hardwired, either socially or biologically or both, into each of them. Whoever initiates first, using whatever aspect of that program they're both operating under, causes the other person to, by default, take on the behaviors of the second part of the program. So, you see this more commonly in a dating scenario, but it can be just as applicable in a business social setting. Okay? James is the rock star, so to speak. He walks in, everybody flocks around him. What happens? He's the prize. He's actively flipping the switch in people's neurology that says, seek him out. And so they go into seeking out behaviors. However, the director could just as easily say, Karen, in this scene, you are the starlet that every woman wants. You're getting approached left and right. You are the most desirable woman in the world. And you just have to sort through the crap. You just got to make sure that only the best guy gets to you. James, you see the most desirable woman who meets everything you've ever wanted, everything you've ever fantasized about. Action. And the play starts again. This program is the same. It's two sides of the same program. Whoever initiates and has the strongest grasp and belief in who they are and what they are doing wins. Most people are moving through the world with a very, very flimsy sense of reality. If your sense of identity and reality is strong enough and you are congruent enough in what you believe and the way you come across, people will buy into your reality by default. Period. They can't not do it. They have to do one of two things. Well, three things, actually. One, they either have to buy into it, they have to get you to buy into theirs, which is usually try and fail, or they have to leave. They can't stay in an area where the reality is in conflict with something else. It's too uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. David, if I could just sure. add that even if you don't initiate the frame, if your frame is stronger than their frame, and it's actually not that difficult. That's right. You just have to have your intent set. Because most people don't in any interaction. Your frame will take over their frame. The, part, the hardest part of this whole, this whole concept is understanding how to talk about a frame without trancing out and be complete, becoming completely confused by it. And the best analogy, the best metaphor I find is basically being the director of a scene in a movie. Because that's exactly what you're doing. When you decide to take control of your own frames and move through the world in those frames, you become the director of the movie of your life. Because you're the director, you decide who plays what part. If they don't play the part, get rid of them. Get a new actor. Make sense? So it's situational? Identity. It can be situational until your sense of identity becomes strong enough that it becomes meta. In other words, it comes across contextual. Um, yes? What he was saying, intent, that's what you're talking about? Well, intent is more contextual. Okay? Um, and it's important because most people think in terms of context. My ultimate goal for my, my mastermind students and, and those who, who continue to study with me is to get you to the point where your frame dominates no matter where you are. 
The minute you walk in, reality changes. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to be able to adopt or become a little bit more flexible in how you behave. Okay? Because sometimes what's considered uh, acceptable or being powerful in a frame is different or appropriate. So you have to use sensory acuity and an understanding of uh, the NLP concept of behavioral flexibility to really make this work. But it all goes back to when I, you know, I, some of you guys come to my martial arts meetups. I'm pretty dominant there too, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm cross contextual. Wherever I go, I tend to, to to be focused there and be viewed as the one in charge. Even with other masters there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's one of those weird... Yeah, yeah, that's right. You've seen it. You, yeah, we're talking about Will guy. Oh, Matt Ramster Higginbottom? Higginbottom? Yeah. Well, well give, to, give them the story so they understand. Oh, well, we went to Yuma, Arizona for a uh, jiu-jitsu slash pressure point presentation. And so, you know, they have the instructor, that everyone there, all the students who were in geese and, you know, yes sir, yes sir, to him, which was their way of showing respect. But we're talking about, you know, teaching students uh, that are younger than, you know, adults. And he was like, well, I don't teach adults. He's like... And the guy kind of conceded in me, like, well, some of us do, you know, it just kind of trailed off, even though he was supposed to be kind of leading the presentation. Yeah, it's, it's, you'll, you'll be, it's weird, is if you have a strong enough screen, people will default to you. Yes, Sean, Sean, I, sorry. Um, how a, every time we go anywhere, and say, like, he pays mm -hmm. for whatever, mm -hmm. they always give me the change. Mm -hmm. But I don't... <laughs> No, I mean, is uh, describing a frame like uh, a difficult? Frame. Can I study it somewhere? Or well, there's lots of there's lots through? of materials out there on framing. A lot of the best framed stuff came from the pickup and seduction communities, um, and and you know a lot of people put that stuff down. But let me tell you something: these guys are active social scientists. These guys are going out there and applying the stuff from the labs, finding out that the shit doesn't work the way they say it does unless you do X Y Z. Now think about this. If you're going to hone a technique, wouldn't it be advisable to hone it in the harshest, most you know, do or die environments possible? Because if it works there, it'll probably work anywhere else. So that's what you do. But to answer your question, um, a lot of the stuff by Mike, is it Michael Hall? Yeah, it's Michael. Michael Hall, uh, meta anything, and Michael Hall's name comes up. Um, so uh, sleight of mouth is a good way to start thinking about meta frames. Kenner Cleveland has a, a course called Magical Objection Master? Oh, or is that's, that's reframing. Yeah, that's reframing, reframing. but influential spinning. Influential spinning. spinning. If you're going to invest in something that's real world and practical, I, would, I always recommend Cameron Cleveland stuff. Yeah. Yes? Well, you were talking, he was saying about, you know, you have a superior and you're, you're out framing him, or I don't know the terminology, but isn't that sometimes not a good idea? I mean, that's where wisdom and sensory acuity comes in. What's, what's the outcome, it goes back to what James said, what's the outcome you are seeking to achieve? What's the relationship that you want in this interaction? Do you want to, to be seen as just another student among many? Do you want to be seen as a peer? Do you want to be seen as his mentor? They're all possible, but you have to set your outcome ahead of time Adopt the frame inside and find out through observation where you can insert it. Yes? Um, what's, like, how do you, what's the best books or like people learn from sensory acuity? Um, influence, uh, look up Jeannie Z. Laborde on the internet. She's an NLP practitioner. Her stuff is mind numbingly boring. What is, what is it one more time? Um, Jeannie Laborde, but she's one of the the, uh, the, the found you know the fun, fun, foundational people in NLP. She has some very very good ways to uh, drills in her books. Uh, are, they're very thin, but they're full of drills that you can use to practice learning sensory acuity. Okay, uh, in CPI we cover the fun the, the absolute must know basics of sensory acuity because, and our approach once again is. Get the big stuff first, because if you can't get the big stuff, the little stuff is just going to blow right by you every single time. If you can't calibrate visual versus kinesthetic, you have no under, you have no business trying to figure out if they're visualizing or remembering. Make sense? Okay. That stuff comes later once you have the confidence 
and the skills, the foundational skill set that you can build on it without overtaxing your seven plus or minus two. Okay? You still have to work within that parameter until you do some kind of weird mental training like silver mind control or some of the uh, awareness exercises that we do in the mastermind or something where you can expand that seven plus or minus two and, and you know, kind of pare down the barriers between your conscious critical factor and your unconscious mind so more stuff comes to your awareness. And, um, kind of like, I'm, I'm not sure if these two are related, but I remember last time I was here during this same meetup up or whatever, you were talking about how like, you have like a radius around yourself. Mm -hmm. Does that play into sensory acuity? You're talking about proxemic influence. Yeah. You're talking about uh, spatial influence. Yes and no. Um, the more authority you have, the more you can encroach upon somebody's personal space and get away with it. Okay? Unless, of course, it's negative authority, in which case you can still get away with it. You'll just send them into nervous uh, system overload, which is a gateway to trance anyway. It's just usually not the right kind of trance you want. But you can get people to confess to shit that they didn't do, <laughs> which is useful, I guess, in some contexts. So understand, everything I'm teaching you has a double edge. You can use it to hurt people, use it to help people. I'm going to suggest that the best approach to this material is to simply use it to help other people get what they want. Okay. okay. Here's the structure that we're going to take today. I'm going to go as fast as I can and try to get it. Yes, Mark. Just just forever, for anyone that's new to benefit and this kind of from a third party perspective, I think what happens is you, you get exposed to these language patterns and your, your the back of your brain goes, oh shit, how do I go from A to Z? And, and I, I can say this because I went through feeling and experiencing. How do you incorporate this, you know, something into your day-to-day -day life when you haven't already? And and I think you know, kind of what Chris was talking about. He he learned really quickly to incorporate one of them, and then he's building upon that. And I think that's a really useful way to, you know, how many text messages do you send every day? Well, you get to think about your text message before saying it. Same with emails. You know, so. Don't try to become an expert on these overnight. It, you, gradually, the, you'll, you'll gain mastery through, through winning one of them, and then you can build on that. Right? As you quickly begin to incorporate these language patterns into your natural way of speaking, you'll automatically find yourself using them every day in all kinds of interesting situations and circumstances in such a way that people simply comply with what you ask them to do, and it's no big deal. As you find yourself keeping a little list that are representational of all the language patterns you're going to be learning tonight, you'll automatically find yourself wanting to use them over and over again whenever you talk on the phone or text somebody, write sales copy, because they'll just fly out. You'll realize this is a good place to put this. This is a good way to do this. This makes this sound so much better. Because all good writing is written with these structures. All compelling speeches have these seven language patterns in them. And all you have to do is go pull up anything Martin Luther King's ever done, read some of Barack Obama's speeches, turn off your cell phone, <laughs> okay, and you'll find them. But they were there in plain sight all the time. Now, when I get a room full of neurolinguistic practitioners or Ericksonian hypnotists and I pull out these seven language patterns, they're all excited, all of a sudden I pull out the first language pattern and they go, eh. because it's not sexy. <coughs> Everybody's in love with the, the, the thought binds, the double binds, the embedded commands, the quotes patterns. They're great, except that everybody's doing them. Every NLP practitioner is trying to use them too. And if you talk to anybody who has any hypnosis or NLP background, the minute you do it, you flag yourself as trying to pull something. They're not stealth. They're not cross-contextual. You have to have a certain level of linguistic acuity to pull them off. These you don't. Anybody can use these right away. Okay? So, uh, I wanted to start with the adverb adjective precepts. Um, is everybody clear on, on cause and effect? The, the simple uh, representational languages for cause and effect is because. Give me a couple more names that are, are symbolic of the cause and effect category. Um. Causes, allows. Yeah, allows. Somebody's been allows studying. Itself, causes you because. To since so. Makes. 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 Becomes. All right. Here's your first drill. It's a. 
I'm going to pull up my list, and I want you to write these down. I'm doing this a little bit differently than I've done in the past, so it's going to be interesting to see how this works out in practice. The words I want you to write down in order are and, as, cause. Write them vertically. Cause, C-A-U-S-E? -E. Yes. Because. As you. Actually, you know what, let's just leave it at that. Let's just leave it at as you, since you, because, cause, as, and can. Now, this particular exercise is designed to overcome verbal inertia. See, one of the problems with learning how to speak this way is that we often find ourselves trying to talk and speak at the same time. And sometimes learning how to speak this stuff on the fly can be a little challenging. So here's what you're going to do first. You're going to get in groups of three. So let's say, let's, James, come on up here. And uh, Chris, come on up here. And uh, basically the way this is going to work is we each have our list of words. And someone's going to pick who goes first, second, third. And that person, say I go first. They're going to read off this list in order the words 